Welcome to the definitive guide to targeting and audiences on Facebook. Everything that you're gonna to need to understand so that you know what audiences to use, why to use them, how they work, why maybe things that other people say you should do isn't actually a good idea for you. And ultimately, let's get down to understand how best to use this amazing technology for your benefit. How you can use Facebook, the world's greatest market research and intent creation device to scale your business so that you can begin to more confidently achieve your dreams, create jobs, create wealth and independence. This is all the stuff that you 100% deserve. And one of the most important things that most people miss is understanding how Facebook ads actually work, especially when it comes down to who's going to see your ad and where you are going to spend your money. So let's dive into that. But first, I just want to say thank you. I know you could be literally anywhere on the internet right now, and you've chosen to spend your time here. If you're on YouTube, please go ahead and subscribe, ring the bell. If you have questions, comment below. If you're listening to the podcast, hey, go ahead and subscribe. Set it up for an auto download. You don't even have to listen, but it would help a lot if you did. And if you're watching this anywhere else and you have any other questions, do not be shy. Go ahead, reach out to me, comment, DM me. I'm wide open. I want to help you out. If you look down to the description below on YouTube too, you're going to see a huge article that covers every single little bit of this and links so that you can join the newsletter so you can get this type of information in your inbox delivered by me to you for free every single week. And if you want to really up your game and you're ready to make the investment in yourself to be one of the best in the world at this thing, check out the Facebook Ads MBA program. It's right below. Let's get started. So the first thing that we have to understand about targeting and audiences is how ads get shown. Now, one of the biggest misconceptions that I see is the idea that you need an audience to tell Facebook who to show the ad to, and that there's somehow this random distribution of where your ads get seen and who gets shown your ad. One of the biggest pain points now, if you know anything about me, you know I'm a huge fan of broad targeting. And I get asked the question probably three times a day. Do I have the budget to go broad? I'm only spending 50 bucks or a thousand a day. I can't afford to do that. And my pain point, my response back to them is, do you have enough money to not do it? And really what it comes down to is people have this opinion that Facebook's going to randomly show ads to anybody within an audience. So if you're targeting broad in the United States, it might be over 200 million people. And that conception is, well, how much money am I going to have to spend for Facebook to learn out of this 200 million people? Who's actually going to see the ad? That's not how it works. It's not a random distribution within that audience. If your ad gets shown to a thousand people and say 500 people like that ad and 500 people hated it, the next thousand people that see your ad are going to look a lot like those people that liked the ad. That 500 that didn't like the ad, Facebook's not gonna show your ad to more people that look like that either. Every ad actually makes its own look-alike audience based on how people receive your content. Because remember, Facebook's business objective is the retention of attention for profit. Their job is basically to make sure that people will stay on Facebook or Instagram for as long as possible and have the best experience. And what that really means is what they're focusing on is trying to make sure that your content gets seen by the people that most want to see it. Now, there's a lot of signals that Facebook uses to determine this information. Um, some of the most common ones that we know and we talk about all the time is estimated action rate. How likely is somebody to see this and take an action that Facebook deems as desirable? like, comment, share, maybe watching the video. But there's also an element of, well, what happens after they click? 
if they go to the website and leave immediately, well, that's not good. And Facebook's less likely to show that your ad to somebody else that is likely to click on it and abandon right away. Or if they stick around for a really long time and maybe make a purchase or fire more pixel events, like add to carts and view content and page you or lead forms, et cetera. Well, Facebook is saying, well, this person, not only did they stay on the website for a while because they know how long you've been on the website, but they also really engaged. And then they came back to Facebook too and, and, and liked more stuff. Now that's after somebody gets shown your ad and that's after they've engaged. But what about the people that have never seen you before? Facebook knows all the words that are on your website. Facebook also knows everything that's in the video that you're showing and all the words that are in the images. The AI is reading literally everything about your website, your content, your organic social, et cetera, anything that it has access to. And based on that, they're gonna use that information to decide who to show that ad to. So it might be the very first ad from a brand new ad account on a brand new Facebook page with brand new first dollar spent. That very first impression is actually a retargeting impression because Facebook is choosing to show that ad to somebody based on previous information they have. And it doesn't have to necessarily be retargeting from you. Facebook might determine, well, this person's just in the market to buy some shoes right now. They've abandoned cart on three other websites that sell shoes that look and feel a lot like yours. And they've also engaged with a lot of content from a bunch of pages that look and feel like yours. And this person is using the same language that you are in their search results based on the stuff that they're clicking on because Facebook's on almost every single e-commerce website. They're also talking about it in their chats. They're watching the videos. They're commenting. They're sharing it. They're talking about it with their friends and family. They might have a history of buying that type of product, that food item, or maybe every at the end of every summer, uh, when fall comes around, wow, this person's every time searching for a nice jacket. Maybe this person is just in market to buy a jacket at this time of year, every single year. Or it's Black Friday. And every single year, somebody's just super excited about video games. Or maybe last year they were really searching for something for somebody that's two to three years old. And the year before that, they were searching about somebody who's one or two years old. And the year before that, they were buying stuff for newborn. Well, they know your kid's like four or five now. So why not show you that stuff? Back to school, holidays, Christmas. The point is they know what's going on because there's literally trillions of data points on every specific individual user. And why this is really important is because we have to understand that the detailed targeting that we see as users in the Facebook ads platform isn't telling Facebook where to show the ad. It's not actually what's happening. What's actually happening is you telling Facebook, I'm willing to pay extra to only let the ad be shown to people inside of this audience. Now, who it gets shown to in that audience is still completely dependent on all of those other factors. But let's say, there's 80,000 people that would like to see your ad, but only 10,000 of them are in this interest group that you've selected. Are they the best 10,000? Maybe 200 of them are actually really good. And out of that 200, maybe three people are excited and actually going to buy. But because you're only targeting 10,000 out of the 80 that wanted to see it, Maybe the other 300, 500, 1,000 purchases are in other groups or aren't in groups at all. 
And we'll dive into how lookalikes and interest groups work here in a second, because I don't think most people understand how they actually function. Because if you understood how it functioned, you probably would never use them again. But the point here is targeting audiences as we see them aren't ways to tell Facebook who to focus your ad to. It's a way of limiting Facebook from showing your ad to the people that want to see it based on other factors and you pay a premium for this. Back in the day, Facebook used to show us, well, this interest group is gonna raise your cost by 5% or 10% or double it. Now they don't. But the point here is, don't think of ads as random things that get shown to anybody inside of a detailed targeting audience. Instead, think of a detailed targeting audience as a way of paying more money to prevent the people that want to see your content from actually getting exposed to it at the cheapest cost. That's what's actually happening. And that's because of how it came about, because this technology predates the ad making the audience. And we'll dive into that in just a minute. I just wanna make sure that we cover this. Ads do the targeting. Audiences don't. Audiences restrict where that ad can be shown. And unless that overlap pretty much only lets your ad being shown to the best people, then you are probably causing more harm than good that you're creating. If you have any questions about this stuff, please feel free to comment below. Check out the description below for the article that explains this in more detail. Sign up for the newsletter so you can get more information like this. And if you really want to take this kind of information to the next level, hey, below is, is the MBA program. There's a lot of other stuff. Please don't be shy. Check it all out. Share this with your friends. Let's dive into more good stuff. Lookalikes and interest groups. How does detailed targeting actually work in Facebook? Let's cover interest groups first. Because I get DMs every single day from people saying, well, broad doesn't work and interest groups do. And by the way, there's a whole video, if you want to take a look at it on the channel, why broad doesn't work. And I want to debunk every reason that people say broad doesn't work and let's explain every single one of them so that you can then say, okay, that's true, but it's actually not real. And we can get into all of that. There's a whole video just for that. Check it out. There's a blog on the site for it. I got an ebook up on the site as well, facebookdisruptor.com. Go check it out. All of that being said, let's dive in deeper. Interest groups were invented in 2012 by Facebook to copy affinity audiences on Google. At the time, Facebook ads were this really bizarre new thing that most brands didn't want to touch. TikTok today is a thousand times better than Facebook ads were in 2012. And that's when interest groups were invented. And they were done to also help advertisers on other platforms adopt Facebook ads. Like, oh, okay, I'm used to using this. I know how this works. They made it really easy for people to come on board and use this new technology, this new option, and spend their money in Facebook. Now, the way that interest groups work, and I say worked, past tense, because Facebook hasn't actually developed any developer resources. They haven't, in, they haven't invested in the update of interest groups since 2017, 2018. Like, the majority of people that I know that are spending a thousand, ten thousand, or a million on a monthly basis started using ads after Facebook stopped supporting interest groups. Remember, you are using very old technology designed to solve a problem that doesn't exist anymore. Interest groups were invented to get people who were comfortable using Google to use Facebook with an audience that made sense. Now, how interest groups work is that they see that you're interested in something, that you're talking about something. There is a false belief that this means that you care about something in a positive way. Let me ask you this. 
when you go to a restaurant and you have a really good experience, it's a B plus work. How many people do you tell about, oh, I had a good time there. I, I might go back. Versus when you go and you have like the worst experience. How many people do you tell that it was terrible? Facebook is saying, well, if you're talking about it, you're interested in it. It has nothing to do with positive or negative sentiment. And you see this a lot also in sports and in lifestyle and especially in politics. The less you like something, but the more you talk about it, the more you are in the interest group because Facebook knows you want to see content pertaining to that topic whether or not you actually like it. You might be a cat person. You got three cats and you're very happy about them and you love them and you are just anti-dog. And anytime somebody talks to you about it, you're like, no, 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 no. Cats rule, dogs drool, blah, blah, blah. If you talk about dogs all the time, you're in the dog's interest group because you're interested in them. Now, mind you, I'm a dog owner. I don't have cats in the house, so I talk about dogs just as much as somebody that doesn't like them. Share pictures of my dogs. But I might talk about the dogs that I own less than somebody who is a cat person and hates dogs talks about dogs on the internet. And it's not just what you talk about. It's the websites you go to. It's the videos that you're watching. If you are very supportive of one political ideology and very anti another one, some of the most engaging content for you is going to be stuff that talks poorly about the positions that you don't hold. You're in that interest group. As an example, you might be a uh, you know, maybe you are a Democrat that is extraordinarily opposed to the GOP. Any bit of news about how the Republican Party has done some other thing you're interested in. You're in that interest group. But if I'm selling stuff that's like guns or religion or military affiliated, I'm going to hit everybody that is interested in the Republican Party and because you're interested, you're going to see my ads. Now, the problem here that we got to get to is that means that probably more than half of that audience, minimum half of those people don't want to see your content. They don't want to buy what you're selling. But you're paying extra money to make sure those people see it. Or at least that they're in the audience of folks that could be exposed to what you're selling. Now, the interest group audiences are also by no means 100% accurate. Recent studies have shown that at best, they might be 33% or more completely inaccurate. Remember, the technology hasn't been updated for many, many years. More than likely, the last time an actual team at Facebook worked on updating the tech of how an interest group functions was before you spent your first dollar on Facebook ads. Think about all the time and years you might have put into this. Facebook stopped caring about it and started telling people to stop using it before you got started. Now, we do see interest groups can work for people, and that's great. And there's a whole thing about broad and all of that stuff. But we also have to remember that there's something else about interest groups. They're dynamic. Lookalikes are the same way, by the way. They update regularly. That audience changes. Now, depending on the volume of data, it might change once a week, it could change once a month, etc. But if you were in that interest group a year and a half ago, do you think you're still in it? Probably not. Matter of fact, I know you're not. But my point is, you might have talked about something six years ago a lot on your Instagram account. Do you think Facebook thinks you're interested in that topic now, even though you haven't posted about it since 2017? No. 
So at what point do you get booted from that interest group? Well, it's actually far more common than you might think. And where this really causes harm is when Facebook's trying to curate customer journeys, if that person isn't in that group anymore, I might have spent money and time to give you three or four impressions or test ads against you, and then all of a sudden you're gone. How much money are you spending trying to curate customer journeys and doing testing for people that aren't there when you're ready to scale? There's a reason these audiences are highly unstable. They're also smaller and create, they're more expensive, so they're far less scalable. Now to touch base for a second, lookalike groups work the same way, but they're using data that you have. Now we already know ads make their own lookalike based on who responds positively to them and takes actions that we're optimizing towards. But you might say, I wanna find, and I see this all the time, uh, I'm going to find people that look like those that have, you know, viewed products on my page. Is that what you want to focus on? If Facebook knows that somebody's viewing products on your page and taking further actions and signing up and doing leads and all that stuff, and they know that down to the actual ad unit, does it help you to ultimately focus those ads very specifically on other actions? Some of it's scalable, some of it isn't. And watch the video on why broad doesn't work to dig down way deeper into how this functions. I just want you to know that much like interest groups don't work the way that you've been taught and they're incredibly dynamic and lack the ability to scale, lookalikes have the same problem. That's why at best, they should be used in addition to broad, but never where you start from. Lookalike groups at best are predictive. If you want more questions on this, please ask below. Let me know if you want more information on it. Sign up for the newsletter to get way more stuff like this. And don't be shy. The last thing that we need to talk about here is retargeting. Now, there's three things that we need to cover right off the bat. Number one, Broad is doing retargeting for you already. How do we know? Your frequency is more than one. Your frequency can't be more than one if they're not showing that ad to people more than once. And who are they deciding to show that ad to? Probably somebody that responds positively to your messaging. Because remember, every ad makes its own lookalike audience based on who receives that ad. Because to break it down one last time, if your ad gets shown to 1,000 people and 500 people hate it and 500 people love it, your ad is going to be served to people who look like those 500 that loved it that may have taken actions that Facebook seems is, deems is good for their business model. And they've taken a lot of actions on your site. So they're making ads, they're making audiences that appeal to users based on that ad. Every ad is making its own lookalike audience. And they're retargeting within that lookalike audience over and over again, especially when you have multiple ads in a broad ad set, all those ads are touching people over and over and over again. And you see something, you know, people are talking about first time impression rate. Who cares? I want my ads to retarget that person. I know that if they're not interested, I'm not going to show my content to them. But if they are interested and it takes six touch points or a dozen for that person to actually make the purchase, good show my ad to that person? Is it better to show my ad to somebody who's likely to actually make a purchase today or a complete stranger that is completely not in any funnel? What do you think is going to do better for my business today? Then the argument is, well, let's make retargeting audiences. Let's like, exclude people that have been to our site in 30 days and then target them exclusively or have another ad set that's just for people that added to cart in the last week or something like that, and then exclude that from broad. What you're saying is, if I have a broad audience, and I'm willing to go that route, or an interest group or lookalike, please don't, but if you are, if somebody clicks on your app, they are completely ineligible for that broad audience to, to see them again. Okay, so the retargeting audience is gonna get all the sales, but how dumb is that broad gonna be? Basically, it's a dating profile where if you don't hook up at hello, then that date is over. Because you can't have more communication because you've already excluded them. 
How successful do you think that's going to be for your business? More importantly, you're also focusing on people that may or may not have, they, they, they didn't say, they, they, you know, you didn't hook up and hello, but they might have told you to leave them alone. And you're saying, well, you, were, you talked to me, so I'm going to continue just pounding my ads in your feed as much as possible. But if they don't want to see it, you don't care. And to be fair, we've said Facebook shows content to people that want to see it. Well, if there's 5,000, 10,000, 20,000 people in this retargeting audience, say it's 10,000 and you're paying to show five, 6,000 people your ads on a daily basis. How many of them do you think have already told you no over and over again? If you don't respect it when somebody tells you no, that's going to create problems. The problem that makes when you're running Facebook ads is that it's going to cost you more and more money to show your ads to people. Not because those people are more expensive, but for two other reasons. Number one, Facebook is seeing you as a bigger liability to the pleasurable experience of Facebook users. And because there's less people for you to show that ad to that are usable, but you that are good for you, but you want to spend more money, the way that Facebook deals with that is they charge you more to reach those people. Your CPMs go up. Have you noticed your CPMs over 30, 40, 50, $100? That's a direct ramification of you showing your ads over and over again to people that don't want to see them. Now, that might be because they don't want to see your content. That might be because when somebody clicks on your store, they have a really bad experience. And so Facebook's not even going to show your content to somebody because maybe it's the best ad in the world, but your landing page experience is terrible. I had an experience just last week, and I'm probably, I might be working with Dara Denny about some more stuff with a piece of content she made for one of my brands, uh, thanks to Triple Whale. And there was a, it was, it was for clothing. And she mentioned her size and the video. Our sizing chart didn't actually cover that size. So our ad initially, everybody loved it. Tons of spend, no results. The next day, a little bit less spend. The next day, a little bit less. And the next day, it went down to like $13, $14. Nothing. We noticed that, well, when somebody clicks on the side, they go to the site. The, the, the thing she says, hey, I'm this, that isn't available. That's a terrible user experience. And our CPMs went from like $17, $18 right away to like over $30 or $40 because nobody wanted to see that ad because we were forcing money into an ad that we liked, but the user experience after the click was bad. What happened when we changed that sizing chart was Facebook fed instead of $14, over $1,800 to those people showing that ad very often to the same people that had shown it to before. We can tell because of the frequency that it was more than one. People were getting hammered left and right with this ad. And instead of getting no sales, our CPA went from like nearly 200 to less than 50 or 60 in, in a matter of hours. Because the user experience changed. And if we had decided to, instead of focus on working at what our ad looks like and our user experience because Facebook is retargeting people over and over again. If we had instead tried to solve this problem by showing our ad to people that had already abandoned cart, people that had already at least once told us no and to leave them alone. If our response to no, go away, leave me alone was instead to throw a whole bunch of money at Facebook to bother that person and cause Facebook harm we would not have had a good result from that ad. But that's what you're doing every single day with every single retargeting audience, especially where you're taking that audience and excluding it from your prospecting. But if you have a full funnel approach, what you are doing is saying, did we hook up on the first touch? No? Okay. You've already rejected me once. I'm going to spend extra to make sure that I show you so much that you'll actually love me. That's unhealthy and desperate and really bad for you.
Now, retargeting comes around because back in the day, Facebook did used to be a random distribution. It functioned a lot like search and display and PPC platforms, but it doesn't do that anymore. And it hasn't since 2018, since the full on implementation of the OCPM environment. That's just not how it works ever. So we have to understand here is that the technology that was made 10 years ago, interest groups and retargeting and lookalike audiences that also, you know, are an act like audience, but just on Facebook, this tech was used to solve a problem where Facebook wasn't able to show the ad to somebody that wanted to see it. That problem stopped existing probably before you ever ran your first ad. But that thinking is really popular because it makes sense. Oh, they added a cart. I'm just going to say, well, clearly they were interested. I'm just going to keep smashing with ads until they buy. Yeah, that might work. But there are far bigger implications to our business when we do this. One, we're reaching far less people, like far less people. So the actual incremental lift we're getting from the platform is tremendously impaired. And that's not an arguable thing. If you're bringing less people into your funnel and reaching less people, there's just flat out a smaller funnel, which means you are getting lower search volume, lower emails. You're getting lower Amazon traffic. You're getting less and less people that actually care about what you have to say on a daily basis, new individuals into your store. That means it's going to be harder for you to scale. That's just a logical progression of how things work. Now, in addition to that, you're also creating harm because you're forcing your ads onto people that don't want to see you. And there's no way for you to know the difference, but Facebook does. And the ads themselves making their own audiences, when you get in the way of how the machine works, how the tech was designed, and when you're still using solutions to solve problems that don't exist anymore, you're going to create harm for the long-term upside of your business. So if your CPMs are high, and I'm talking $25, $30, $40 or more, where are you using lookalikes? Where are you using interest groups? Where are you using retargeting? Where are you not prioritizing what happens after somebody clicks on your site? If you're still using lookalikes and interest groups because somebody told you that you should, go and ask that person, how does an interest group work? Most people that I know that suggest it don't have that answer. They say, well, it means that you like something. That's not what it means at all. How many things do you like that you don't talk about on Facebook? You're not in that interest group. The point is we have to be way more intentional with how we're using the machine. And the point of this today is to tell you how this stuff works so that you can begin to focus on scaling your business instead of making reports that look good while the business struggles to pay its bills. You can focus on interest groups and retargeting audiences and lookalikes and get a better and better ROAS for sales today that you can attribute to Facebook ads. And eventually you won't have a business to run anymore. Unless the business is so good that you can do Facebook poorly and still be successful. And if that's the case, you should just be running broad anyway. I hope this stuff makes sense. If you have any questions about it, please, Comment below, let me know what they are. I'd be more than happy to answer. Check out below for the article to describe everything that we've talked about here. Sign up for the newsletter, it's free. If you wanna know more about the MBA program, click that link, you can get on my calendar, you can check stuff out, you can take a deep dive through the program. I'll show you everything that you're gonna put your money on. I reveal, take you behind the scenes, show you everything. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you're still here, smash the like. It would mean the world to me. And until next time, I'll see you on the internet. By the way, I think YouTube thinks you might like some of this stuff. And over there, don't be shy. I'll see you later. Bye.